Well, welcome everyone, welcome ladies and gentlemen to uh, this event and also, uh, of course, welcome to uh, Keith Khan Harris, our speaker today. Um, this is an event in the Conspiracy and Democracy Project, which has been a five-year project funded by the uh, Liberty Front Fund and uh, we're kind of coming into the final stretch at the moment. Uh, our PIs have been John Norton, um, and Richard Evans and David Brunsman, so we've had kind of three strands, <coughs> sorry, uh, one on the internet, one on history and uh, one on political theory. Um, we've covered a lot of ground, uh, we've kind of been looking at French Revolution and uh, protocols and uh, populism. Uh, in some ways we've laid the, the kind of the groundwork for today's talk because we did have, I was just looking it up before, it was about three years ago that Deborah Lipstadt came to speak to us um, on Holocaust denial. And I remember that she actually began by uh, acknowledging Richard's uh, contributions to, not Holocaust denial, to the fight against Holocaust denial. <laughs> Let me clarify that. Thank you. <laughs> um, Richard, of course, was called as the, kind of the expert witness when David Irving uh, took Deborah Lipstadt to court on the charge of libel because Lipstadt had uh, accurately uh, described him, uh, described David Irving, that is, as a Holocaust denier. So in that sense, we've kind of um, laid the groundwork, and I guess in some ways, I, I remember Deborah actually kind of said that, you know, it's really important that we push back, and, you know, like, thanks to Richard's efforts, uh, Holocaust denial is no longer a clear and present danger. Of course, you would say they haven't been vanquished, but I mean, we've kind of pushed back against them. But in some ways, the kind of the insidious thing about conspiratorial thought in general is that it opens up new fronts and manifests, manifests itself in different ways. And I believe that Keith, you'll be kind of talking about that today, the fact that this denial or denialism, as you call it, uh, now we're kind of confronting that in other fields, such as climate science, such as uh, vaccines. Uh, and so it's present in other forms now. Um, let me just quickly say that um, uh, I kind of, uh, of course, did a little bit of research and I landed upon your Amazon page and I was thinking, is this really all the same Keith Kahn Harris? Because I find books there on extreme heavy metal music and on Judaism. And I was kind of then thinking, you know, okay, that's interesting. Am I looking at two different people? Or where is the intersection? I don't know, maybe it's the beards, the rabbinic beard, and the <laughs> music, that's where they kind of come together. But um, Keith has published uh, on a wide array of topics. He is a lecturer at uh, uh, an honorary research fellow at Birkbeck College. Uh, he also has affiliations with the Institute for Jewish Polish Policy Research and Leo Beck College. Uh, I kind of get the impression that uh, simply citing these academic positions does not do justice to all the kind of activities and interests in which you are kind of invested. So you simply kind of have to, you know, just do the Google search and you'll find that you're also very present. Uh, you've uh, also published, obviously, with the, the Guardian and the New Statesman. Um, and so the talk today is denialism, post-denialism, and the boundaries of the speakable. And in some ways, this is a bit of a kind of a sneak preview of the new book, which has the title, correct me if I'm wrong here, but Denial, the Unspeakable Truth which is coming out in September. September. September, exactly. So we're privileged here to get a bit of a sneak preview of that. Uh, the vote Keith has also just assured me that this is more than just a sales pitch for the book. You'll be integrating also some other ideas. Let me also just quickly say that we will, um, we will um, proceed as we have in the past. Uh, we'll have a, a kind of a lecture of about 40 minutes, I guess, thereabouts. Uh, then we will have Richard from the project who will give a few comments. We will open up the floor then to uh, a discussion, and then after that we can adjourn outside, and uh, we can adjourn and meet outside once more. Um, there'll be drinks in the, in the foyer here. Uh, perhaps also, just as the last thing, uh, because the, this is the penultimate event, uh, and I believe I'm not wrong in saying that uh, also in this week we have the kind of the final showdown. Um, Marlon Solomon will be I guess, what is this, Hugo? Is this a kind of like a comedy routine? Comedy, yes. Okay. Uh, so, a darkly comic tale of one man's journey through the conspiracy underworld. That's a free live performance taking place uh, at 6 o'clock on Friday. Uh, exactly. At uh, the main lecture theatre in Old Divinity School, uh, St. John's College, Cambridge. So, that's kind of in some ways the last hurrah for the project. We'd love to see you there. Um, but in any case, uh, yeah, I think uh, you might have a hard act to follow, 
Thank you. Thanks very much, and thanks for allowing me uh, to speak here. I'm going to get the plug out of the way. Um, <laughs> this is the book that will come, be coming out uh, in September. And it's a kind of hybrid book. It's a book that is both academic and non-academic, and neither of those things at the same time. Uh, it's actually an extended essay uh, for a publisher called Notting Hill Editions. Um, if you would like to know, it's out on September the 13th, if you would like to know more about it. Um, I have, I, I don't know about GDPR here, uh, but I'm going to ask you to, if anybody wants to know more to put their email address on this, and I, I promise to. <laughs> abuse it as, uh, <laughs> just, you can hand this around and I won't be offended if you don't sign up. Anyway, and as I say, this is not just a pure plug for the book, that's it. Uh, I'm not going to show this slide again. S what I am going to start with is something that's probably going to make you groan, uh, which is Donald Trump. One of the problems with dealing with Donald Trump is that you're caught in an impossible bind. On the one hand, this is somebody who thrives on attention, positive attention, negative attention, to the point of dominating media and public discourse. And one doesn't want to necessarily play along with that. Um, and at the same time, it's important, certainly as a sociologist or anybody who does scholarly work, not to get so blindsided by one particular figure uh, that they don't see the larger social forces at work. On the other hand, he is the president of America. And it's certainly true that his election has catalyzed something ha or, has, um, or has been the result of something else that was cata catalyzed. So I'm starting off with this tweet, which is actually from 2012. So it's a little while ago. Um, uh, before, I think he was just exploring running for president at that point. And he says the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. This isn't the first or the last um, uh, tweet or statement that he's made casting doubt on human climate change. But what I will suggest uh, uh, when I come back to this a bit later in the lecture is that, that this is kind of paradigmatic of something new. But it's something new that also looks like it's something very familiar. This looks like standard uh, American conservative denial of climate change. But I would say that there are crucial things here that are different from that and that suggest that we might be uh, entering some kind of new age in terms of denial. But let's start with denial. Um, it has to be said, I think, that the best, that I would say the best book on the subject of denial, or at least the most, uh, the one that's most pungent with ideas, if you like, is Stanley Cohen's uh, book, The States of Denial, which came out about, uh, about 10 years ago now, something like that. And of course, I probably would say that because Stanley Cohen uh, is a sociologist. And I like his definition here of denial. I think it's quite elegant. He refers to it as a statement about the world or the self, or about your knowledge of the world or yourself, which is neither literally true nor a lie intended to deceive others, but it allows for the strange possibility of simultaneously knowing and not knowing. The existence of what is denied must be somehow known, and statements expressing this denial must be somehow believed. I think that's the statement actually needs a lot of reflection to tease out. But what I find interesting about it, and what I find more generally interesting uh, about denial uh, as a process, is that it seems to take us into a territory that is, that is somewhere between truth and falsehood, somehow where between sincerity and lies, to a sort of netherland where one isn't quite sure what is actually going on. What's also interesting, I think, and here I'm talking more generally to discussions of denial, perhaps in the Freudian tradition, is denial is something that may be simultaneously or neither pathological or normal. To some extent, denial is part of the process through which we apprehend the world. 
certainly in the Freudian tradition, one can see the, uh, the knowledge of the, the terrible knowledge of the way we are and the way the world is as something that we cannot permanently, continuously deal with. So we have to strategically deal with this stuff and ignore certain things whilst simultaneously being aware, uh, aware of it. And this is a point that has long been made by a number of scholars. We can think of the book. It's not read as much as it used to be, but it was, it was a huge success, I think, in the 60s when it came out, The Denial of Death by uh, Ernest Becker. And Ernest Becker talks about uh, the denial of the fact that we are mortal as being uh, one that is essentially human and one that is necessarily human. He talks about how human beings would not work on what he calls immortality projects, which are projects, collective projects that will survive one's death. One would not do that without a certain element of denial of the fact that we all are mortal. So the question of when denial is normal and when it is pathological is a very, very live issue. And it's also interesting, though, that um, in, in the wake of what we probably call the vulgar, vulgarization of Freud, denial is often seen as purely pathological. And we might see here that that might be one of the reasons, I think there were a lot of other reasons, but one of the reasons why David Irving brought his court action against Deborah Lipstadt which was to be called a Holocaust denier, even if you are a Holocaust denier, is to label you as somehow pathological. Um, it's, it seems to suggest a kind of sickness. Now, that's denial. What is denialism? Now, here, importantly for my talk, I'm suggesting that denial and denialism are two interlinked but separate things. Here's a definition of denialism from... Um, two brothers, Mark and Chris Hufnagel, who run a website called denialism.com. Denialism is the employment of rhetorical tactics to give the appearance of argument or legitimate debate when in actuality there is none. These false arguments are used when one has few or no facts to support one's viewpoint against a scientific consensus or against overwhelming evidence to the contrary. They are effective in distracting from actual useful debate Using, using emotionally appealing but ultimately empty and illogical assertions. Now, what's interesting about this definition is that it doesn't speak to a wider human processes, to the human mind, to the nature of what it is to be human. It's much more specific. It applies to a set of techniques. And notice also that where, where I went to to get a good definition of denial was to a, to a social theorist. If I want to get a good definition of denialism, I go to two brothers who run a website that debunks a lot of denialist claims. So denialism doesn't necessarily have the kind of intellectual pedigree that denial does as a concept. It is usually something used by uh, those who fight denialism, by debunkers, if you like. Um, but it is no less, it has no less pathological um, connotations than denial does. No one wants to be called a denier, but nobody wants to be called a denialist either, quite the reverse. So, but I still necessarily think that this distinction between denial and denialism is a necessary one. Briefly, there are a number of areas where denial and denialism can be found beyond that of everyday life. And I think this should be familiar to most of, most of you, so I won't spend too much time on it. Most modern genocides have been denied or been the focus of denialism. The Holocaust, most famously, but also the Armenian genocide, Bosnian genocide, Rwandan genocide, and so on. Global warming is probably the next most famous kind of denialism. Then there are people who deny that AIDS causes HIV or that indeed there is a thing called AIDS. Denial of evolution has a long pedigree going back, of course, to the 19th century, sometimes known as creationism. Then there are people known as anti-vaxxers who argue that vaccinations uh, causes ill health rather than fights ill health bit more complicated, but that's it in a nutshell. And then more recently, there are those who deny that the, the story of the September 11th attacks uh, 
the official story, quote unquote, is the real, is the real story. Now, what I'm suggesting here is that the conceptual framework of denial and denialism can be applied across these different fields. And that they're, but most importantly, that there are a similar set of techniques that you find in all of these different things. And also that denialism in these situations is uh, impelled by a similar set of circumstances. So I want to go back to, I want to look here, I want to focus a little bit more on how to distinguish denial and denialism. So what is climate change denial, as opposed to climate change denialism? Has anybody read this book, Living in Denial, by Carrie Marie Norgard? It's a really lovely um, ethnographic account um, of a couple of years that the author, who's actually American, spent in an unnamed small Norwegian town that uh, was partially reliant on the winter sports industry. And it's about what happened during a couple of winters where very little snow fell until really late January. And it's about how that situation was, this was in, this was in the early 2000s that this happened. And how the residents of that town responded to this with simultaneous acknowledgement and denial of what was actually going on in terms of climate change. On the one hand, the lack of snow in a Norwegian town wasn't just an economic problem, it was also a threat to Norwegian self-identity, which is the, as the author shows, um, cold weather and snow are central to what it is to be Norwegian. And on the other hand, despite the seriousness of this, the residents of the town in their talk about what was going on, would really attribute it to short-term factors. Oh, it's a bad year. Oh, things will be better next year. And there was very little talk of the wider context of climate change and what its consequences, particularly the long-term consequences, would be for this town in particular and Norway in general. So what we're seeing here is, deni is denial, she, ar she argues. And it's not a spectacular thing. It's not necessarily politically motivated in, in an obvious way. It's an everyday process in which a looming terrible truth is not engaged with. Contrast that with climate change denialism. And what you find is something like this. This is the logo of the Global Warming Policy Foundation. Does anyone know who runs that? Nigel Lawson, uh, which is uh, a British example of a wider global trend of uh, substantially funded institutions that churn out a continuous series of reports and research studies that argue variously that uh, climate change is occurring, but it is not serious. Climate change is occurring, but it is not the result of human activity, or that neither is the case, that there is no climate change and it is not caused by humans. This is a very institutional thing. You can point to other organizations in America that do the same. Um, of course, it's much more established over there, things like the Heartland Institute and the various institutions followed by the Koch brothers. Is it Koch or Coke? Koch. Koch. All oh, right, sorry, there's, a, there's a, no consensus in the room about that, so let's leave it. Um, so this is very different, I think, from the everyday denial that we saw in that Norwegian town. This is something that is institutionalized that is done strategically by organizations funded by the process to create, to not just simply not talk about something, but to talk about something, right? And we see this in the Holocaust as well. So there are many examples in the post-Holocaust era of silences. One of those, for example, is the silences uh, in places like Poland or Lithuania or Ukraine, or Ukraine of local collaboration with the Nazis in pogroms and murders of Jews. Never total silences, but certainly great discomfort. And sometimes those silences can be semi-officially mandated, that there are certain things that you do not say. In contrast, Holocaust denialism, although confusingly I use the term Holocaust denial in the book, 
because it's just easier to use the term Holocaust denial because that's what everyone knows it as, is not about silence, it's about creating institutions and journals and books. It's creative in the same way that global warming denialism is also creative. Creating institutions such as this, the Institute for Historical Review, which since the 1970s has been one of the, although it's not so active now, has been one of the centres of producing Holocaust denialism literature. So to sum up, this isn't in the book, um, I've tried to sum up the difference between denialism and denial in the following sort of table. So first of all, in terms of what each creates, I suggest that denial creates silence or absence, often a pregnant silence, or a silence that everyone knows is there in the same way that denialism is both simultaneously present and absent. Denialism creates noise, it creates activity, it creates something. In terms of its relationship to truth, denial avoids it and, it's, and is in the process vulnerable to truth or vulnerable to facts, however you want to put it. And yes, truth and facts, we can debate the difference between those two concepts, but let's leave that for another seminar. Denialism doesn't avoid truth, it recreates truth. It tries to create a better truth. And in doing so, resists truth. This is active, whereas denial is a kind of, sometimes aggressively passive, but sometimes passive nonetheless. Denialism is active. Who produces denial and denialism? I argue that denial is produced individually and privately, albeit necessarily across the society, but it may be publicly enforced. It may be that, you, that, that the public sphere enforces what can and cannot be said in the private sphere. In contrast, denialism is institutional. I think that's a really crucial point, that denialists create institutions. And it is public, by definition public, and may sometimes be publicly sanctioned. I recognise that sanctions are a little ambiguous there. Uh, it can be used in both senses. Sometimes denial is publicly prosecuted, but sometimes denial is, is publicly produced. In terms of relationship to scholarship, denial avoids scholarship. There's a kind of aggressive ignorance there. Whereas denialism imitates or pastiches scholarship. Denialists are very, very concerned to create scholarship of their own. What is the alternative to denial and denialism? I argue that the alternative, and this I'm going to speak about this in due course, the alternative to denial is, as Stanley Cohen talks about it, acknowledgement. That if we didn't deny, we would acknowledge that something was out there with all the moral consequences that follow. In contrast, the alternative to denialism is affirmation or celebration. So to take a, give a, a proper example here, the alternative to Holocaust denial in the sense that I'm using it is an understanding and acknowledgement of the seriousness and the moral obscenity of the Holocaust. The alternative to Holocaust denialism, also called Holocaust denial, apologize for that, is to say, is to not acknowledge that it was a moral obscenity, but that it was a good thing, indeed something that we should celebrate. So who opposes denial and denialism? I argue that efforts to oppose denial, in the sense that I use it, are focused on education. There is an absence there which people attempt to fill by saying this is what is happening. Education, if you will. Whereas denialism, because there's no absence there, is opposed by debunking, by taking denialist arguments and saying, in the same way that Richard Evans did, this, these things are wrong, this is how you have distorted history or scholarship or whatever it is. Now I recognise this is very schematic and there's a lot of overlap between the two and a lot of ambiguities, but I think this is broadly where I stand, broadly the framework within which I'm working. But as I said before, one of the things that define denialism is a set of techniques. And this is where discussion of denialism sometimes gets a little bit lost, because most discussion of denialism, not all, is done by people debunking denialist claims. And so often there are intricate taxonomies of how denialists work. 
So for example, I have a friend who runs a website called Holocaust Controversies, which debunks Holocaust denial. It sort of basically fights Holocaust deniers online. Not literally, but well, not, not with violence, but you know. Um, and one of the problem with debunkers is sometimes there's an element not to see the wood for the trees. But what I've tried to do is to step back a bit and say, what are the common techniques that are used in all of them? And I've isolated three, and it's not a comprehensive list, but it's maybe a good starting point to understand what is going on repeatedly in, in these very different fields. First of all is radical doubt. Um, you, to give one example of that, one of the main arguments that global warming denialists make is about the unreliability of modeling climate. The complexity of climate means that we cannot be certain to any level of, or, or at least to the point, we cannot be certain what is going on to the point that we, where we should actually do anything about it. And there's a constant process of opening, uh, raising the goalposts. And often they're pointing to absences in the historical or the scholarly record and saying, because of those absences, we cannot be sure of anything. So one example would be in the Holocaust, another fact of the question about a written order signed by Hitler saying, go and do the Holocaust now, is, is, is sort of seen as generating all kinds of doubt. Another example is obsession with detail. So one example of that would be uh, it, amongst intelligent design theorists, that's a, a more modern updated version of evolution denial, which suggests that all the evidence point to there have been a designer in creation. A huge amount of that is devoted to one topic, which is the eye and the complexity of the eye. The complexity of the eye is seen as so is, is, is seen as irreducible and therefore evidence that, uh, that uh, there was a designer and that evolution was therefore impossible. But what you see with this is on forums where people contend with these ideas, there's incredibly minute discussions about the eye, or in the case of Holocaust denial, the case of chimneys on the gas check of the presence or otherwise of chimneys and how you spot one from an aerial photo or what this document says or what this word on this document says. And this is a very common denialist technique to focus down on, because actually there there's more of a level, level playing field. On the big picture, it's very difficult to argue against things. On the small ground, there's a chance. If you move the playing field to somewhere like, uh, somewhere like the eye or chimneys, then you've got a chance. But, I mean, and relevant for this program, conspiratorial thinking, I would say, is a central part of uh, essential technique. Because ultimately, a conspiracy is not only inevitable, but necessary. Because there's always a question in denialism, which is, okay, if it is so obvious that the established truth is wrong, why has everybody been taken in? And that leads to some kind of conspiracy. I mean, the nature of the conspiracy can be different. Sometimes it could be a conscious effort by a group of people to fool people. Sometimes it could be some kind of mass moral failing. If you look at someone like Melanie Phillips, who denies climate change, the anthropogenic climate change, the way she sees, sees it is that this is a mass lack of confidence in the West, in Western ideals and in Western rationality. And that has pervaded to such an extent that it has essentially becomes a conspiracy theory, even, there is, even if there isn't necessarily a hidden hand behind it. And this is connected to what's called the Galileo fa uh, fallacy, uh, which, some, which I found on a debunking website, which is the idea that if you are a minority and abused for your ideas, you are necessarily correct. Um, it's certainly a fantasy or fallacy that is found very commonly throughout a range of different denialisms. But to some extent, because denialism is about creating something rather than the absence of denial, any good denialist argument, any good argument is any denialist argument. Just to simply do it is effective in and of itself. So here's, and it doesn't even matter necessarily if that argument is easily debunked by experts. 
That's partly because the audience isn't necessarily experts, but it's also because the point is as much as anything else to keep the argument going, to keep it alive. So here's one example. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this is, I read the Lechter report. Have people heard of the Lechter report? I assume this was, this is a foundational text of Holocaust denial that was produced in the mid to late eighties. Um, that is still widely quoted um, by an American gas chamber technician called Fred Lechter, um, who, based on quote unquote research he did at Auschwitz, uh, purports to show that they're, that what is uh, what are treated as gas chambers there could not have been used for the purpose, at least to that extent, and therefore the Holocaust. Uh, is, is, is seen as something that can be open to challenge. It's a story open to challenge. So on the left is one of the key points of his, of his argument, which is because of the time it takes for Zyklon B, uh, res, uh, the residue of Zyklon B gas to clear from a particular space of the gas chamber's size, they could not have been used for the purpose because they simply take too long. They take about 20 hours. So therefore they could not have killed that many people through, through the use of gas. Now, when I read that, I read, first read that a few years ago, I realized that I had absolutely no intellectual tools to say that's nonsense. And I would imagine none of us in, the, in this room have that knowledge. In fact, most people don't have that knowledge, but other people do, of course. And this is from the, on the right is from the NISCOR project, which amongst other things challenges Holocaust denial arguments. And that provides a pretty devastating refutation of Fred Lechter's argument. But here's the thing. Fred Lechter's uh, it, it, paragraph here and in the rest of the report, it looks very technical. It looks credible because it looks partly because, in part because most people would not understand it. And that gives a certain credibility. If you look on the right, the NISCOR project is written with admirable simplicity and clarity in a way that pretty much everyone could understand. But that necessarily, that doesn't necessarily inspire trust because it doesn't look like expert discourse. And that is one of the fundamental problems uh, with denialism in that it is highly resistant to debunking amongst those who, do, who want to be convinced. Now, there's a lot of um, psychological evidence that has come up and from the neurosciences about how um, I, people change their mind with great difficulty and that people have enormous amount of resistance to change and that it's hard that this sort of process of enlightenment reason doesn't work very well in practice. And of course, that's all true. But in part, what's going on here is simply a kind of audacious triumph in producing something that looks like legitimate scholarship. So why do this? One of the drivers of denialism is the emergence of something that is uncomfortable. So for example, the 1964 Surgeon General's report on, this is just headings really, um, the Surgeon General's report on tobacco uh, in America, which pointed pretty strongly to the fact that smoking caused cancer. This created a crisis in the tobacco industry, and that crisis was met by the development of denialism, uh, which you don't see so much now. Most tobacco industries have now pretty much accepted that smoking is dangerous. But through the use of denialist techniques, through the use of denialism, they managed to keep the show on the road for several more decades. Other examples of that would be oil report, uh, reports within the oil industry, such as uh, reports that were commissioned by Exxon in the 1970s, that pointed very strongly to the future and current possibility of carbon-fueled climate change. Another example of that was the publication of the, On the Origin of Species, not in 2959, <laughs> but in 1859. I'm sorry, I'm not brilliant at PowerPoints. Um, 
these sorts of publications create crisis. And there's a kind of fork in the road. Where do you go? Do you acknowledge what's going on and accept the moral implications? Or do you resist? And what we can see is a lot of the time you resist, or a lot of people have resisted. You can see this sort of choice in a, a fascinating book that was produced, uh, when did it come out? About five years ago by Bettina Stagneth called Eichmann Before Jerusalem, which drew in part on recordings that were made of Adolf Eichmann in the 1950s talking to a group of ex-Nazis led by a guy called William Sasson, who's a Dutch, uh, ex-member of the SS, Dutch SS man and father of Saskia Sasson, uh, the sociologist. Um, Stagner's interpretation of what was going on in these salons is that the ex-Nazis there were disturbed about what they were hearing about the Holocaust. Most of the ones in that salon were not particularly close to the centre of the, the Nazi hierarchy and did not want it to be true. They did not want the Holocaust to be true. And they invited Eichmann to talk about what really happened, hoping to have their denial and denialism confirmed. Instead, Eichmann did the opposite and talked with considerable pride about what had happened. Now, as it happened, both uh, Sassen and others at that salon did not actually participate in the development of Holocaust denial. But nonetheless, one can recreate that as one of those moments when that fork in the road opens between denial, denialism, and acknowledgement. But more generally, what does denial, denialism, uh, what drives it, is what I call the gap which is something that emerged in modernity. What I call the gap is the distance between one's desires and one's ability to speak of those de uh, desires. Now that gap, of course, is something that is talked about a lot, not just in modernity, but previously, how we speak of our desires is a common human problem. But I suggest that in modernity, certain classes of activities that were previously able to be legitimated within public discourse and private discourse became much more difficult, if not impossible, to do. And certain desires became unspeakable. So here's an example of something from Julius Caesar's Gallic Wars, where he's talking about laying waste to the country of Ambiorix. He's talking about it very openly in a quasi-celebratory manner. Now, of course, a historical approach would be to say, did this actually happen? But it's not really the point here. The important point is, is that Caesar, in writing a valedictory volume to himself, talked about something that is not too distant from genocide as proof of his strategic brilliance, his greatness as a general. It's very hard to imagine someone writing this in the modern period. Not impossible, but very difficult. Genocide is something that has occurred throughout human history, and certainly in the modern period, it has become perfected and produced, uh, continued to be produced. But the language of genocide, the language of public celebration and legitimation of genocide has withered. If you look at for example, um, Franz Sta uh, uh, the name's gone. Um, who wrote the book about Franz Stangl? Um, Into that dark. Gitta Serenely. That's it. Gitta Serenely's book about Franz Stangl. Uh, Franz Stangl was the commandant of Treblinka. One of the things that comes across in all her discussions with him is that he didn't have a language. He didn't have a language to speak of what he did. And it isn't just that there were very good reasons during the Second World War why the Nazis didn't openly, to a great extent, speak of what they were doing and celebrate it as it was going on. Very good strategic reasons, tactical reasons to keep what was going on from the potential victims. I would argue that there was also a very limited language available to do it in modernity. 
And if that's true for genocide, it's also true for other things. So, for example, polluting the earth, venality, doing things to, uh, to increase one's wealth at the expense of others, refusing to accept things uh, on evidence. All these sorts of things are very, very difficult to speak of loudly and proudly and publicly in modernity, and yet at the same time, we still desire to do them. And I argue that that is the primary driver of denialism. So to conclude, so to sum that up, denialism legitimates the unspeakable, the literally unspeakable, through the use of the prestige language of science. And by the way, what I'm saying there is also, I'm arguing that denialism is not anti-science. It is not an assault on science, as it is sometimes treated. In fact, it is the opposite. It is a tribute to the prestige of science the prestige of scholarship. It concedes, if you like, from the outset that these things are the way that one argues for what one wants in modernity. So therefore, what is the alternative to denialism? This is what I call the denier's alternative. I don't call it the denialist alternative because the denier's alternative is a bit of a snappier title, and that's one of the chapters of my book. Sorry for the confusion. What I, do, what I do in that chapter of the book, and apologies for the plug, is to show that within denialism there are pointers towards an alternative to itself, in the sense that denialism doesn't necessarily give the game away, but in the way it couches its arguments, it leads very close in a lot of occasions to acknowledgement to, for the example of Holocaust uh, deni uh, denialism, to legitimating the Holocaust, but it never takes that final step. Here are a couple of examples. This is not about Holocaust. Now, this is from Anne Coulter, not one of the world's greatest intellects, it's true, uh, but a very prominent global warming denialist, amongst other things. And here she say, go forth, be, the God says, go forth, be fruitful, multiply, and rape the planet, it's your job. That's our job, drilling, mining, and stripping. Sweaters are the anti-biblical view. Big gas, gas guzzling cars with phones and CD players and wet bars. That's the biblical view. Now, it would be a very short step to go from that to say, and therefore, even though human action is exacerbating global warming, we should do nothing about it. It would be very easy to take that step, but she doesn't take that step. Similarly, I found from a post on a Holocaust uh, denier's web forum, why had the Nazis herded them into cattle cars and taken through extermination camp to dispose once and for all the Jewish problem? If Hitler had developed a final solution to the Jewish question, then there had to have been a Jewish problem. Again, this is from a Holocaust <coughs> denier, but it looks like it's not. The next step in that argument is to say it was right to murder the Jews. But that is a step that cannot be taken. I would, however, argue that things are changing, and this is where we go back to Donald Trump's tweet. And what we're seeing is the emergence of what I call post-denialism. Now, Trump's argument here isn't just that global warming isn't happening. It's a very specific claim, specific claim, that global warming is a fraud created by the Chinese for a specific purpose. Now, that is not a claim that he has subsequently made. It is not a claim that other global warming denialists have made. It is probably a garbled version of a very common argument that is made by global warming denialists, that if the US and the Western world takes action against uh, climate change, we will suffer a competitive disadvantage against the Chinese and other uh, developing, uh, other developing countries. So this really is taking an existing denialist argument, a disciplined denialist argument, and pushing it into a new direction based on entirely what is in his head. And I go argue that that is paradigmatic of what we're seeing now. This is what I call post-denialism. One of the things that drives post-denialism is the erosion of denialist discipline caused by the empowerment that one finds in the internet and social media. 
everyone can be one's own nihilist anymore. So I was saying before, uh, before, before the talk started, when I, was, when I was younger, I was always fascinated by conspiracy theorists and Holocaust denial in particular. But I never really had access to any of that kind of literature. And even if, even if I wanted to perpetuate Holocaust denial, I don't, I'm Jewish, uh, for the avoidance of doubt, how would I do that? It would have taken commitment. It would have taken access to networks and institutions designed for, the, for, for, for that purpose. These days, it's very easy to do that. And you can see this in the, what's known as the 911 truth movement. If you compare that to Holocaust denial, there is really no left a report. There is no institute for historical review. There, are no, there is no canon in the way that Holocaust denial has developed a canon. It is undisciplined. There are multiple different explanations of what really happened. Some arguments suggest that no planes hit the towers. Some argue, yes, there were planes, but there were no passengers. It was remote controlled. Some argue that the, and I'm not making this up, that the World Trade Center had no floors. Uh, I once saw someone who argued that they were, they were, it was something to do with Tesla, that they were Tesla towers. They got electricity from air or something. It was, I didn't really understand it, to be honest. And also the culprits are various. Sometimes the culprits is the Bush administration, sometimes it's Mossad, sometimes it's the Zionists, sometimes the Illuminati, and various other culprits as well. So there's no consensus here. What there is here is a very creative, uh, freewheeling kind of milieu in which lots of different arguments, often contradictory, cross-fertilize and proliferate. So what I'm doing here is uh, updating the uh, table I showed you before and putting in a column on post-denialism. So whereas denial creates silence, denialism creates noise, Post-denialism creates what I call noisy absence. Arguments that are barely there, that are not particularly coherent, but nonetheless create a lot of noise. Whereas denial, denial's relationship to the truth is one of avoidance, and denialism's relationship to the truth is one of resistance and recreation, post-denialism's relationship to the truth is one of multiplicity and individuality, or one might also say empowerment. Denial is produced individually, denialism produced institutionally, post denialism is, is produced un, in an undisciplined manner, but publicly. Whereas denial's relationship to scholarship is one of ignorance and denialism's is imitation, post denialism's relationship to scholarship is, I would argue, insouciant, in the sense that a certain sense of contempt, a certain sense of being better than that. So the alternative to denial is acknowledgement. The alternative to denialism is affirmation. The alternative to post-denialism is unclear. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It can be acknowledgement, it can be affirmation or celebration. As to what opposes it, I put in question marks there, because at the moment I would argue this is something that most people do not know how to oppose. Because we, are, because we are still living through it and have not yet become used to it and, and understood what this phenomena is. So I want to give an example here of Holocaust post-denialism. This is from, have people heard of Gilad Atzmon? He's a he's Israeli, born Israeli jazz musician, um, lives in the UK. Um, he describes himself as an ex-Jew. He has become increasingly popular in what one might call the crossover between far right and far left movements. And he argues, what is the Holocaust religion there to conceal? As long as we fail to ask questions, we will be subjected to Zionists and their neocon agents' plots. Holocaust religion robs humanity of its humanism. For the sake of peace and future generations, the Holocaust must be stripped of its exceptional status immediately. It must be subjected to thorough historical scrutiny. Truth and truth seeking is an elementary human experience. It must prevail. One can see echoes here of the sort of rhetoric we often find in Holocaust denial. But the difference is he never quite comes out and says the Holocaust didn't happen. He kind of hedges his bets. He positions himself 
in a, in a place of radical uncertainty, which is incredibly difficult to pin down. And here's another example from the Style Guide to the Daily Storm, which is a far-right website. The undoctrinated should not be able to tell if we are joking or not. There should also be conscious awareness of mocking stereotypes of hateful racists. I usually think of this as self-deprecating humour. I am a racist making fun of stereotypes of racists because I don't take myself super seriously. This is obviously a ploy and I actually do want to gas kites, but that's neither here nor there. How do we respond to that? What actually is that? This is quite common in alt-right discourse and in far-right dis discourse generally. It is both Holocaust denial and celebration of the Holocaust and both and neither. There are also new models in the world um, that I think are changing the situation. <coughs> Whereas most authoritarian regimes and genocidal regimes have for the last two, three hundred years and even before that tried to hide a lot of what they did, to try and hide their savagery, their desire, their brutality. It's increasingly common now to find leaders who celebrate it. So you can see that here in the discourse of Duterte, the president of the Philippines, who openly talks about killing. Um, he, said, he said something like, Hitler killed four million Jews. I don't know why he says four million Jews. Hitler killed four million Jews. I'm happy to kill four million drug dealers. Then there's Islamic State which actually treats the possibility of rape, <coughs> slaveholding, and mass murder as a tempting prospect to encourage re recruits. This, I think, is a very different thing to what we've seen previously. And I think it speaks of the possibility of a language in which desire can be legitimated publicly. Again, these are models that can be taken on or taken up. And we don't yet know if they will be, but certainly Donald Trump has spoken very positively of Duterte, if not of Islamic State. So how do we respond to post-denialism? I would argue that there are actually possibilities in it, in the sense that one of the problems in modernity is that it's hidden the inescapable fact of moral diversity from us. Because both people who commit genocide and those who oppose genocide <coughs> speak in a very similar kind of language. So Holocaust deniers implicitly concede that genocide is a bad thing while at the same time legitimating it. If people could come out and celebrate the Holocaust again, <coughs> to celebrate or accept the deaths of millions that will follow from uncontrolled global warming, then there at least is a possibility to see, for the first time in maybe hundreds of years, what is it that people actually feel morally. And there's also possibilities of truly free speech. My own argument about whether deniers should give in a platform is, that, is to say that this is not a free speech issue, because denialists are not speaking freely. They're speaking under a terrible burden where they cannot speak of their desires. So would it be possible, therefore, to have truly free speech? Now, of course, I'm not naive. <coughs> I understand that truly free speech is not possible because there is always a gap between desire and speech. I understand the post-linguistic turn in philosophy. But nonetheless, it might be possible to have freer speech and to have the disconcerting possibility of a debate between those who celebrate genocide and those who oppose it, which has historically, certainly in the last few decades, not been a possibility. Perhaps only when genocide or other evils, or I would call them evils, are a speakable option can we truly argue against it. I will go back to my book now. This is kind of where I ended it, and I kind of feel like I'd argued myself into a corner and left myself with an argument that I didn't particularly like to have made, which is, do we really want this? Perhaps denial and denialism is protecting us as much as anything else. Could we really live in a world in which we would have to make the argument that it is wrong 
the people are killed in their millions. Perhaps that gap that emerged in modernity preserved something or prevented something that would be very difficult to deal with. I don't necessarily have good answers to this. But has anybody seen the film The Act of Killing? This was a film by, I can't remember his first name, second name, Oppenheimer. It was a documentary uh, made about uh, veterans of the uh, anti-communist insurgency in Indonesia in the 1960s, which involved the deaths of hundreds of thousands. And in that film, Oppenheimer got these, these veterans <coughs> to reenact their, their crimes, reenact what they had done. <coughs> which allowed them, some of them, to express how exciting it was and how wonderful it was. But for some, it also allowed a moral reckoning with what they'd done and really created a clear moral disturbance and a reckoning with the evil that they had perpetrated. And this leads to a very difficult conundrum, which is, is the only way to change the world to prevent things like genocide from happening, to make genocide a possibility again? I would like to think the answer is no, but I, as I say, I feel I've kind of argued myself into a corner, and perhaps some of you can help me get out of it. As I say, this is the first talk I've given on this subject. Thank you very much. So uh, thank, thank you very much indeed for that. I mean, I'm not sure I can put my thoughts into any coherent form, but there's certainly you prompted a lot of them. Um, I think, first of all, I wonder about your distinction between denial and denialism. Um, and you yourself, in fact, at many different points in your talk, uh, undermined the distinction. Uh, although you uh, then went on to apologise for the fact that you were confusing the two. Um, but I think it's very difficult to draw a hard and fast line between them. <coughs> um, denial, for me, um, as an historian, uh, or as an ordinary person, is simply, it's a very simple thing. It's saying something hadn't happened, uh, which, for which there's a lot of evidence, of convincing, overwhelming evidence, that it has happened. But I think you... When you say denial, uh, you had a lot of different definitions. So denial is both knowing and not knowing that something happened. It's somewhere between the truth and lies. Um, it implies that denialists know that what they're denying actually happened. You began. Uh, and then you went uh, on to say uh, that uh, in your, your schematic distinction, denial is uh, not saying that something uh, didn't happen, that you know happened, or you're avoiding the truth, so you don't want to confront it, or that you're ignorant of it. You had a number of different ways of looking at it, and your solution was to education. So the implication of education as a solution for denial is that the people who are denying something don't actually know uh, that it happened, and if you tell them that it happened, education, then they will believe it. Um, that, to me, that I don't find that very convincing. Denial is a positive act. If somebody says, there's, there's a, six million Jews are killed, and the denier, the denier says, no, they won't. Somebody says, the world is getting warmer. The denier says, no, it isn't. It's much more, I mean, someone once called sociology the painful elucidation of the obvious, but uh, to me, this is not actually obvious at all. It's complicating matters in an unnecessary way. So I don't really accept the distinction you make between denial and denialism. Uh, you can't say, you can't deny something if you don't know. If you don't know it happened, how can you deny it? Um, so uh, that, that's my first problem, I think. And then you, are, you apply the label of denialism to a number of other different things. So <coughs> genocide, well, the Armenian genocide, um, well, uh, or the Rwandan genocide. There is a difference, I think, between calling something a genocide, the label, uh, which is what the Turkish, all parties in, in, in Turkey say, the Armenian uh, killings were not a genocide. Um, 
but you're disputing the label. Uh, you're not actually, I mean, you might minimize, you might reduce the numbers, but you are actually admitting that something happened. Um, evolution is even more complicated because evolution is a way of explaining facts. It's not actually a statement of facts. So that uh, intelligent design is a different way. It's a less convincing one. Uh, it doesn't fit the facts as you know them. But you're, you're talking about different explanations there. 9-11 is different again. Because as far as I can see, nobody denies the Twin Towers were, uh, were destroyed. What they disagree about is why and how. So again, that's a different kind of, different kind of thing. Um, I don't accept that Holocaust denialism is institutional at all. There are a lot of individuals. David Irving, for example, has never been attached to any institution at all. He's always done it on his own. Uh, some have been attracted to uh, the so-called Cell Style Institute of Historical Review in California, uh, like Robert Thorisson, who was a Holocaust denier before, and they sought some kind of institutional legitimation. But it's not something that they needed in order to write books saying that six million Jews were not, were not killed. Um, there's a question which is a very puzzling one, and, and if you've seen <coughs> the MOOC denial, at the end, and this has actually happened in the trial, the judge suddenly stuns the defense of every step by asking, do you think that David Irving is sincere? Does he really believe that um, the Holocaust did not, that the Holocaust did not happen? Or does he really believe that six million Jews are not killed, that no gas chambers are used, and so on? Um, and, and that, of course, in one sense, that was not particularly relevant to the trial. The trial wasn't about why he did these things, why he said these things, and why he wrote these things, um, which Devon had said and criticized. <coughs> but everybody agreed that he actually did believe. He didn't think, he, wasn't, he didn't think that, um, well, actually, it's it's maybe Jews were killed, but I will, I will say something different. But all appearances, he appeared to believe that there was a gigantic worldwide conspiracy sort of described. Um, to fool everybody into thinking that it's when Jews were killed when they weren't. Um, I don't agree that the word, I mean the word, you use a lot of terms which I think are very vague and disputable. And you didn't really define any of it. So pathological, what's pathological? It's a label you attach to something you don't like um, in, in terms of human motivation. I don't think David Irving brought the libel suit against Debrelitska for calling him a Holocaust denier and falsifier of history because he felt insulted by the implication that he was pathological. I don't think it is his head. He brought the case, it seems to me, because uh, she had criticized him when he was most vulnerable. He was an author whose income depended entirely on his books, and his books sold because they claimed to be more accurate and more deeply researched than any other books on World War II and on the Nazis. It hit him in his pocket, it hit his reputation, and also because he had become an hard life Holocaust denier a few years before, he'd been frozen out of the media and he wanted to get back into the media in order to propagate his, his views. I don't think his, the, the concept of pathology doesn't come into it at all, in my view. Um, I think that's making too much of it. Um, I think that. Another concept, one with which I've always had huge difficulty, and I don't think I've ever used in my books, is modernity. What is, what's modernity? Uh, it's a label you attach. It seems to me what you do is you, you, you implicitly attach it to liberal values. Modernity is the growth of liberals. It's a bit like when you remember uh, a couple of decades back, an American political scientist, Francis Fukuyama, after the fall of communism, published a book. Um, predicting that now the dirt will try everywhere, everyone will be liberal, and democracy would spread right across the world, and so on, how wrong he was, unfortunately. Um, modernity is basically the values that, that, that you like. Um, and by implication, when you talk about Trump, IS, the, the, the return of the justification of genocide, you're saying that genocide is not modern. It's, it's uh, that they are not modern. Well, there's a huge argument that's been going on for a long time about Nazism, was it modern or not? But in my view, it is. It's a, it's a form of modernity. Certainly in the instruments and methods used to kill Jews and many others. And also, incidentally, 
um, in many of its other attitudes. So uh, I don't really accept the, the kind of view of modernity that you take, or indeed the concept of modernity itself. I don't think modernity, it may be liberal values, I and mean, in countries where there's a kind of liberal political culture, then it's difficult to justify things like mass murder or war. But there are plenty of others you can think of. Most centrally, of course, the Nazis, Third Reich, where people did do this quite openly. Um, you have to just have to look at Himmler's speeches, uh, Nazi propaganda, all of these things, uh, where there's a kind of uh, reversal of liberalism. So the word brutality, the word fanaticism, they're positive words in, in Nazi propaganda. They wouldn't be to us and our belief in liberal modernity. And I'm making an assumption about the audience here. Uh, but, but maybe so it's a good one. Um, it's acceptable. So I think I had a lot of problems about the way in which you you conceptualise your your talk. Um, Trump certainly. Um, I, I think he's a very modern modern figure. Uh, what's disturbing to us, of course, is the way that he doesn't care about whether it's true or not. That's what you call kind of post denialism. And I think denial, at least the deniers care about whether something's true or not. They just have to confuse the majority scholarly opinion to accept the fact to evidence all of those things. They produce alternative forms of evidence, as you say quite rightly. Um, uh, deniers tend to assemble lots of pseudo facts, like Fred Lustre, for example, uh, in, in the passage that you quoted, that, make it, that give the appearance of scholarship. It's called pseudo scholarship. But Trump doesn't care about that at all. Rather like Again, the Nazis, I'm sorry I keep coming back to this, but I've worked on it a long time. But the Nazi Ministry of Education assembled and told a, a, a convention of school teachers uh, not long after the Nazi seizure of power, uh, you've got to stop thinking about the truth. Truth doesn't matter. What matters is what's useful to us. And that is basically Trump's view, I think. Um, so, for example, apparently when, after the big tax reform that went through Congress and the site, he went to a lot of his business pals and said, you, you guys just got a whole lot richer. Um, there's a question of, of, of values here, and we assume the universality of, of um, liberal values in what you call modernity. That I just don't think is necessarily there. There are many forms of, of modernity. Um, I don't think modernity itself, if you, even if you accept that concept, has rendered desires uh, of certain kinds unspeakable. Um, so I think, uh, oh yes, yes, tobacco firms, oil firms, uh, of course what they did was to, when, when research came out arguing tobacco killed people or oil, you know, fossil fuels don't cause global warming, they simply commissioned alternative research that looked scientific and they uh, presumably believe it's, it, it's scientific. So uh, I have to say I did have a lot of problems in your talk. So your turn to. <laughs> you know what? That's really useful. Um, because, as I say, this is the first time I've done a public talk about this. And you write alone, and this is what happens. Um, but I would say some of the, the areas of disagreement may, may be to do with my own lack of clarity. Uh, and my own tentativeness, because I think we may disagree about th less things um, than might be first than it might first seem. So to take some of these things, um, I do not see education as a res as the best response to denial. But I, what I'm arguing is the is the resp response that is generally given to denial is to educate against it. The idea that there is a silence about something, and so institutions and organisations and individuals try to educate against that silence. I'm not saying that that is necessarily the, the best or the most appropriate uh, response to it, but is nevertheless that is what is generally uh, done. I think the best, I think the most interesting point you made though is if you don't know how, if something happened, that something happened, how can you deny it? And I think that's true. I think that that is certainly a weakness in my argument. And I will go away and think about that. Um, in terms of my use of the word pathological, I'm not personally 
using it myself to, that is, I'm talking about the connotations of things like denial in, a, in the wake of the vulgarization of Freud. That is not necessarily the way I would put things myself. But the major issue is about modernity um, and whether, and me painting it as kind of the growth of liberalism. What I would argue is no, no, I'm not. I'm certainly not. I don't think modernity is a universal process. I certainly don't think that liberal democracy triumphed every, everywhere or anything like that. What I would say, though, is particularly in the 20th century, particularly in the post-war period, there is a universality in the language of liberalism, the language of liberal democracy. So here's a good example of it, is in global warming denialism, uh, when it's created by conservative groups, that is often put in the language of concern for developing countries. So we cannot fight, we should, should not and cannot fight uh, carbon use because if we do, people outside uh, the developed world will suffer from that. Now, that is a kind of political ventriloquism by people who usually are apathetic at best about developing countries. But they are using the language of liberal concern for the developing world for their own particular concerns. There's something similar happens in Holocaust denial as well, where one common argument that you find is Hitler was the Jews' best friend, which is that, which tries to paint Hitler as a source of restraint against the justified anger of the German people against their depredations, which can sometimes, in some versions, come close to treating Hitler as uh, a liberal in a very difficult, not necessarily a liberal, but as someone who, was, who, had a, who had a duty of care that he took very seriously to all his citizens, whether Jewish or not Jewish. Again, that's a case of political ventriloquism that accepts the idea that the way we speak of things is the liberal democratic way of sp speaking of things. So yes, I do think, I mean, if you look at any, if you look at the propaganda that is produced by authoritarian regimes today, if you go on a website, for example, for a country like Equatorial Guinea, which is a, it's a kleptocracy. It's one of the most brutal, thuggish regimes in the entire world. It is designed purely to extract value uh, from oil and, and share it amongst a very small elite. You look at the rhetoric on the website about democracy and about human rights, it isn't very different from what you would find on any liberal democratic country. And I'm arguing that actually that is an example of the universality of liberal, of, the, of paying lip service to, to, to the ideas of liberal democracy. And in that respect, I think Fukuyama had a point in the sense that the way we talk of things in the world had become kind of flattened. And that language of liberal democracy has very little ability to speak of our desires to acquire, to kill, to do all those sorts of things that we've already, do, already done. And I, as I say, I don't think that genocide is a non-modern thing. That is precisely my point. It, it, is a, a con, it is a historical constant, although the nature of genocide, how it's perpetuated, has certainly changed in modernity in part because of Te technological developments and, and the transport and so on. These are constants, but the language through which we talk of things is not a constant. I think there are historical breaks, and I think there's been profound historical breaks in that, and yes, you could call that modernity. Um, but you also point to certain elements of Nazi language. Now, of course, I wouldn't say that Nazis spoke in the language of liberal democracy. And yes, they talked about that we should brutally smash whoever it was. But what didn't happen is the final step. What didn't happen is saying, because the Jews are, are, are who they are, we are going to make a determined effort to kill every last one of them. Now, the reason they didn't say that was in part because of logistical reasons, because it made sense to not tell people, uh, not tell people what, was, what fate was awaiting them. But I'm not sure whether that was something that they could possibly do. Now, you could point to Himmler's Posen speech, 
as the counterexample for that. But A, the posed speech was a speech behind closed doors, albeit the fact that it was recorded. And even then, if you look at that speech, what you're seeing is very much Himmler saying, yes, we did these things, although he doesn't quite say it in, in great detail. We did it, but we kept a sense of who we are, and that is what was heroic about it. What there isn't there is bloodlust. What there isn't there is, the, is, is engagement with the pleasures of the flesh that mass killing creates, and the horrors of that as well. And that is why I talk about, if you look at, imagine what would have happened if the Nazis had won and, and the genocide had been entirely successful, and, and it's, it's a stretch to think of that as well. Uh, would there have been statues for Franz Stangl? Would there have been statues for Oscar Derlewanger? Is that how you pronounce it? I can't remember. Would, there be, would these people be talked about in history books? And I would say the answer is they wouldn't. Certainly in the USSR, someone like Vasily Blok Blokhin. I'm not good at these are all people I've read about but never pronounced before. I'm having a major problem in this lecture. Next time I speak about this stuff, I'm going to get the pronunciation right. Vasily Blokhin, he was the uh, executioner of the Katyn massacre. So he personally killed, estimates vary, but it's in the tens of thousands. Now he died in obscurity and in disgrace after Stalin fell as an alcoholic. But even if Stalinist rule consisted in perpetuity. He was not a national hero. There was not a language to speak of that. That is my argument. Whereas a language to speak of that may have been, able, may have been there in the past, certainly in what might call ancient times. And that is what has changed in modernity, is my argument. And that is also what might be changing back now. That's where I'm coming from. Okay. Does that make things a bit clearer, at least, even if we don't agree? Uh, yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Both parts of that. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Keith, and also thank you also for uh, recognising that harsh criticism can be a lot more useful than uh, that of praise. Oh, I've had harsher. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I don't have to worry about your sensibility. No, we do have time for a discussion, and um, I think we have a few questions. So, John, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the talk. Thanks. I've been baffled as to how one might uh, deal with Trump, and uh, I think I don't think you've answered the question, but but you've illuminated a bit. <laughs> um, and also, I've no desire to, to to be nice to Francis Fukuyama, but I think Richard he, he was he was basically um, I'm saying that liberal democracy rather than modernity had, had was, was the end of history, so to speak, rather than. Um, and um, but just a detail, which is I was very interested in the the book about Eichmann after Jerusalem, and wondering what's the implication of that that those revelations for say Hannah Arendt's famous treatment of Eichmann. Well, Bettina Stanglis's book is kind of taking issue yeah. with that. He's taking his, he, he, her <laughs> argument is that once he was deported to Israel. He presented himself as a grey bureaucrat. Yes. And but actually he was, according to Stagneth, a that these recordings reveal that he was a passionate ideologue yeah. who took enormous pride in what he did. Um, so Hannah Arendt was taken in. I don't think it, her argument's quite that unsubtle, but I think that's partly the. I, I would say that's that to some extent is what you say. Of course. Hannah Arendt has been contested by a lot of different people as well before yeah. Stagnath. But I think it's, uh, I actually think there's probably room for reconciling the two arguments to a degree. But. So I'd say that all concepts are useful until they cease to become useful. And I would say that with some conspiracy, some conspiracy theories can be put into that, those categories. I'm not sure it's necessary. I, I think it becomes less useful to do so. My, I think there's a wider field of conspiracy theories that cross cuts with what I'm talking about, but I don't think it's identical to that. 
I think the conspiracy theory is as much as anything about, it's about personal empowerment. I mean, it's about a lot of different things, but I think it's partly about that. It's about, it's a kind of Promethean act that recreates the world. Um, that's my general line on that. But yes, it could be put in my schema, but I suggest it's probably not useful to do so. Well, I think it's more than it's more than just saying yes, something is the case. No, it isn't. It's about creating and it, using a series of techniques that are widely used to create a kind of counter knowledge, to create an alternate body of scholarship that against something that has overwhelming series of facts. So, something like conspiracy theories about the middle landing do draw on the similar techniques, right? So, they're, they're, if you look at two conspiracy theories about the moon landing, there'll be huge amounts of detail, which is one of the things I said about flags, <laughs> what sort of shadows <coughs> flags cast, which is a very common denialist technique. Whether it's useful for other reasons to, to, to fit that into my scheme, I would say possibly not. Um, yes, um, just a comment on the moon landings before I ask my question. If we wait a few years, there will probably nobody left alive who's worked on the moon. So that will give you the mileage that it's fun. Um, but my question is, um, in terms of your classification of denial, denialism, post-denialism, where does we had enough of experts fit in? I would say that's, well, the first thing is to say that you're actually raising an important question, which is very relevant in, in terms of Holocaust remembrance, which is the fact that the fact within the next 10, 20 years, there will be no survivors left. I think it's probably less significant than it seems because the presence of survivors at the moment hasn't presented a Holocaust denial. Uh, the, the people, someone saying, I was there, I saw this, that hasn't impeded it. So I'm not sure. Anyway, but the second thing was, sorry, what was it about? We have had enough of experts. I think that's a post-denialist thing because a denialist attitude to experts is to create one's own experts. To say there should be no experts, that's a post denialist thing. Although I think that Michael Gove probably actually said what he said for a political advantage rather than through a uh, systematically thought through position. Okay, um, um, two questions. Um, one is first of all, I, I, I enjoyed your talk, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm more sympathetic towards you um, than our uh, respondent, um, because they spend more time talking to sociologists. And I think <laughs> a part of the problem here was that a historian doesn't need to play the same language games as a sociologist. Um, but uh, something I think that might help um, you to make a stronger case is, I liked your, liked your table. Take your row headings from your table. For each of your different types of denialism, um, say how well you think, say, um, Holocaust denialism or 9-11 um, or climate change, how well it fits each of those row headings. Um, you could rate them, them as well. It's kind of rate them, how, how successful. They... So, yeah, I mean, just say, to what, uh, I mean, some of, some of what you were saying is you were saying, well, no, I don't think, um, you know, Holocaust and fits in this uh, um, this category so well. So yeah, um, that um, uh, might. No, that, can I just might undermine it? Could, but it, it might. I think there was probably also, the fact that both your Richard Evans mentioned it suggests that, that that I was misunderstood at one point, which is I occasionally use the term Holocaust denial when I mean Holocaust denialism mm -hmm. simply because Holocaust denial has got brand, brand recognition. Right, and I was apologising for the confusion that that leads that that, that leads to. Um, but yes, I get I get what you're saying. I don't actually use that table in the book. <laughs> uh, I created it for this uh, as a way of summarising a complex set of distinctions. And yes, to applying that as a grid to individual denialism sounds like a great idea, which I will think about doing in the future. Um, has second, second point, very briefly. Um, 
when you came on to talk about poster nihilism, I was um, reminded of something I thought about, and, and like so many, I was brought up saying, well, yes, we must learn about what happened in the past, we must learn about the Holocaust so that it never happens again. And, then, and, and so I, I dutifully did learn about um, the Holocaust, and then I lived through a period, and it's still ongoing, of people making statements about Muslims that sound very, very similar to what I learned in history lesson, you know, from people making statements about Jews. And so I, 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 I began to get a bit annoyed at how many programs you made about the Nazis, and it didn't seem to learn anything, didn't seem to be able to apply the analogy to ourselves. Um, so I'm wondering, um, is that maybe a, 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 a well, there is the question of. I'm in a similar position to what you're in now, of thinking maybe it would help if we if we communicated better of the motivation that people had, um, so then we'd be able to say to see ourselves in the same position. To see today's society, people have got similar motivations and they're coming up with this stuff again, and it's going to happen. Well, there are issues there about uh, how, how, whether we should learn from history, for which I will defer to historians about that. Yes, thanks. So just to, I'm curious, with, with the exception of the comments about the, the Nazi party, we're also going to talk about minority groups. And I'm curious, especially in the, the context of Central and Eastern Europe today, we see a lot of sort of state sponsored denialism. And, a couple of examples that come to mind are in, in Poland the, the sort of denial of, or the, the, the whole counters uh, the reality around the uh, plane crash that killed President Kaczynski. And in Russia today, we could look at the Salisbury uh, uh, poisoning or the MH370 uh, uh, mm -hmm. episode. So, what role does power play in sort of uh, contemporary uh, denialism? So, I'll answer that in two ways. First of all, once you're in power, a lot of things become possible that weren't when you weren't. So if you look at Stephen Harper's uh, reg uh, as Prime Minister of Canada, who came from a global warming denialist's background, he was able uh, to prevent research in certain areas. Uh, there were, if you look at the scientific community in Canada, they saw it as an absolutely catastrophic development. You're seeing something similar with Trump. You can use your power to prevent certain things be, being researched or found, or found out. You can enforce things, or as Turkey does, uh, preventing discussion of the Armenian, uh, Armenian genocide. But I would argue that what's happening in, in Russia is better classified as post-denialism than denialism. One of the reasons is, if you, if you see from Russian media outlets, at least the ones we get over here, um, and from Russia, Russian bots and all that, all that on Twitter, one of the things you see is that a proliferation of different possible counter explanations to the quote unquote official narrative about the, uh, the plane and about the poisoning and about what's going on in Syria. And that's very much reminiscent of something like 911 denial and very much re reminiscent of not the kind of attempt to create an orthodoxy that you see in denialism, but about the idea of undermining any notion of, ortho of, of uh, orthodoxy at all. The best, person, the pe best account I've had of that is, is Peter Pomerantz's book, Everything is True, Nothing is Possible, on Russia, which is basically saying that this is, ironically, this is top down, but it is top down deliberately encouraging a proliferation of often quite bizarre counter-narratives counter -narrative, to create a permanent sense of being unmoored, which is similar to perhaps to what other authoritarian regimes have done in the past, but I think is very much an interesting new twist on it. And I would say that is one of the drivers of post-denialism today. Has Camille your ability to spot the Canadian accent by giving the example of Canadian Prime Minister? I had no idea. <laughs> I didn't spot it. Thank you very much. Um, I found a lot that I'm quite illuminating. I suppose I just have a question of this move from denialism to post denialism to try to articulate it. Some of it seemed to overlap slightly. So you did talk about denialism as any type of denialism is good denialism, which suggested that 
in Zionism at the moment, the fact that there is that there is a proliferation. Um, sorry, it's, it's to do with the fact that you're trying to say that post denialism is supposed to be kind of disciplined. Post denialism was no longer disciplined and had lots of different things saying happening in lots of different areas. But that seemed to be already the case in denialism because any type of denialism um, is is good. So so I'm not sure about that part, but uh, but the part that was interesting was they say that people like Trump now like well they don't care to ground it in any type of pedantic research anyway. Like, they just say what they want. I wonder if whether you're suggesting as terms of finding a language within which people can articulate these certain human desires that they have, whether that would actually, rather than try to push back against the post denial moment or where the post denialism moment or where would actually just fan the flames of it. Um, because clearly what's happening is a lot of this type of language is getting getting a type of legitimacy that it not, might not have before. And I wonder rather than in public discourse, it's not like in public discourse we don't have terms to describe what a lot of the figures that you're interested in did or the mass assassins, mass murderers, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, these are not very positive things. But that may not be a bad thing itself. Whereas a lot of what you're saying about these people have become too addressed or past, I wonder whether that's more than an indi individual psychological level rather than a kind of society level, where there's a distinction that needs to be made there. Yeah, those are really great points and a lot to think about. As I said at the end of my talk, I feel like, feel, and I felt this, and I say this at the end of my book, I feel like I've argued myself into a corner. I don't genuinely know whether that kind of moral accounting is either possible or necessary or desirable in, in any way. I certainly know that, certainly as a Jew, the idea of people going around calling for me to be killed is not a prospect that I particularly welcome. But I do think, though, that something at some point probably had to give in the sense that a world, the, the kind of, and yes, it is, I am slightly fukuyama I probably admit it, the sort of, the lack of language available to talk publicly about certain things was probably going to break at some point. So I'll give you an example of that, which maybe I could have mentioned to talk, but did it. Um, there's a volume for, um, that was produced in honor of uh, Stanley Cohen uh, a few years ago, and there's an essay in it, uh, a kind of rereading of the, lynch of the lynching, lynchings in the American South, lynchings of African Americans. The way he read it was that these were, if not necessarily spontaneous, these were acts of resistance to, uh, by poor whites in, in America to official discourses that had rendered their desires, their desires to kill and to oppress illegitimate. Now, what's interesting is at the same time, what was happening in the elites within the southern states was creating highly sophisticated networks, highly sophisticated practices that would on the outset be liberal democratic, but in practice would be essentially a form of apartheid. But that wasn't enough. The fact that official state authority was, by all accounts, making black people in America set in the, in the southern states into second class citizens did not assuage the desire for something much more visceral. And I think that tells us something quite dis disquieting. If you remove the language for certain desires, that doesn't remove the desire. And that's why I'm, I've kind of hit a wall a bit, because I'm not entirely sure where that leaves us. It leaves us in a very difficult place. Well, perhaps we can work it out as it brings you outside and deploy it. Would that be a possibility? No, it's not a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an optimist there, yeah, in saying that. But um, nevertheless, I think it might be the time to uh, call it a day and um, firstly to express our thanks to Keith for a really stimulating talk. So thank you very much. Thank you.